board, board. and I'll minimise the, uh, I'll probably actually remove the video panel so that it doesn't broadcast our faces across the internet when I record it, um, and we'll get started. <clears throat> so please just interrupt if you have any questions tonight. Our, our topic is really topic three. Um, we're going to morph pretty quickly into assessment task number one, um, because I have a feeling that's where a lot of the, um, uh, the real passion is. Um, so please ask any questions you can about that. Um, they are all more than welcome and um, I look forward to receiving them, please. So let's get started. We're going to do a quick overview of the ACS and I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I actually think most of you are pretty au fait with the ACS, but I will make some connections to it. Um, we're looking at the chemical sciences strand and, and a lot of people kind of balk at chemistry. And, and let's face it, it's considered a hard science. A lot of people think they're not, not wired for it. And for that reason, a lot of teachers, believe it or not, even adults and teachers, when we look at the conceptual frames and representations we'll talk about, a lot of primary teachers just can't relate to chemistry, which is a real shame because it's actually a lot of fun. And, and the, the first one we can look at, the first area, is, is at the area of materials. And we can see here that from the science by doing site. So if you haven't been in there and had a look, they've got a fantastic little um, unit called rock, paper and scissors. And it introduces the whole concept of materials. And, and we all know how to play that game. But then what we do as teachers, and this is an excellent one also for assessment task number one, when you're doing diagnostic, is to actually get them to assess the properties of these materials. Um, and, and then to have a look at, at what the context of the material is and what the substance might be. And then you can actually take that discussion probably right across the whole materials um, uh, learning frame. So it's a nice way of looking at it. If you haven't looked at pa uh, rock, paper and scissors, do. Um, and it, you know, I, I think you'll actually see that it's a really, really nice way that you could weave it even into your diagnostic tool for um, assessment task number one, if you're stuck and looking for something to do. It's a game most kids know how to play. <clears throat> so our topic this week, um, the ACS, we know it's got three interrelated strands. Um, understanding human endeavour and inquiry skills. Within the understandings, we know we've got this, the four substrands, um, biology and uh, earth sciences and space sciences were all done in term one, and chemical and physical sciences were doing in term two. I don't want to turn a blind eye though to the human endeavour and the inquiry skills. Um, I think they're really, really important um, and equally important strands in the ACS. So, you know, and sometimes, for instance, when we struggle to teach chemistry, we can actually teach inquiry extremely well and in, in teaching inquiry we can actually deliver really really good knowledge outcomes in the, in, in the chemical sciences field so chemical science is a substrand it's concerned with understanding the composition and behavior of substances and the key concepts chemical and physical properties of substances are determined by their structure at an atomic scale and look you know Loxley talks this week about 600 BC and and you know the the Greeks coming up with the word for the atom and the concept but that was just a representation I mean we know that that um <clears throat> that concept is not entirely true now you know we, we we know that we consider with quantum physics we consider the behavior atoms quite different uh, to we, we considered them originally so we you know we're evolving theory is catching up uh, the more you know the more that we learn and, and the more that we grow and the key thing here is substance change in new substances are produced by rearranging atoms through interactions and energy transfer and you know, energy is a big part of this unit as well. Some of the energy we look at of course is heat, um, which is really an obvious one and it's one that you can use with students really well. The Australian curriculum, I'm not going to talk too much about that, there's a nice little diagram there that looks at the learning areas, how they you know, cross pollinate with cross curriculum priorities and the general capabilities. So the ACS, you know, we've got science sitting in here <coughs> and it cross pollinates to the cross curriculum priorities and also to the seven general capabilities. So when we look at a primary connections unit, all that means is we can see these general capabilities mapped onto a science unit. We can see the cross curriculum priorities, they also get highlighted quite strongly. And when we look at chemical science, sustainability is probably the most do dominant. Um, cross curriculum priority that comes through the curriculum. Let's have a look at why I say that and what that means. So we're supposed to, by the end of this week, it's, it's an overview, bear in mind, um, but we are going to look at some aspects of, of the curriculum. Um, but we're going to locate the chemical understandings. We're going to describe the links between science understandings and cross curriculum priority sustainability. And we're going to look at, you know, won't spend a lot of time on this because it's actually spelt out in most of the units you will look at, but general capabilities are expressly mentioned. 
the key terms, general science, sustainability, general capabilities. As you can see, there's a little bit of repetition there and they probably are the, the take home terms. The composition, structure, properties and changes of matter. That's what we're looking at. Now we're going to do it over two weeks and the body of, of content um, in, in weeks six and seven, we, we look at the content in, in two different weeks and I split it there for you into materials and the second one into physical and chemical changes. So we don't try to cover too much content at once. We look at related content and the goal in week six and seven, we'll focus on how to teach this content. Now on that theme, <coughs> some resources. Um, who's been into the Scoodle resource and had a look at it? Anyone like to offer a comment? Um, yes, I went in there and it was um, really good. It Thanks is one. lovely. Thank you for your feedback. It, it is quite good and you do have it there. It's a free resource for you. Um, and particularly, I love the way it deals with science investigations because um, it actually helps us. And, you know, and often, this is an out of area um, uh, discipline, chemistry. Most of us aren't trained in chemistry, but we finish up teaching it to kids. So what we've got to do is develop a love for it. And you know, this Scooter resource, gives you that the scientific frameworks. You can draw on those scientific frameworks. This resource really embeds it well. So, you know, again, I commit that to you as, as a really good way of, of um, you know, adopting the science um, pedagogy, um, and particularly the investigations. And some really good sections in there on reporting and data capture as well. Um, often things that teachers don't think too much about, you know, it's all about doing the science, but then you actually have to capture the understandings and then you have to interrogate the understandings. Then you have to deconstruct them then you have to reconstruct them and then you have to link them to real world practices. So, you know, it's really important that we do look at each of those steps as we go through and certainly we'll mention them. In this course, this term, we start off by looking at assessment task number one. Okay, now assessment task number one looks at the learner and the misconception and then how the teacher will pick up that misconception and translate it into pedagogy. Assessment task number two looks at assessment. It looks at some existing units of study and how the assessment either supports, inhibits, or confounds the learning for students in those two units of study and ask you to make some recommendations to improve them. So, you know, we're going to look at this, the curriculum from both ends and in there also look at a fair bit of uh, chemical and physical sciences content as well if we can. <clears throat> Primary connections, what can we say about this? Scoodle and the five E's, they're all interrelated. Primary connections is built around the five E's model. Scoodle is designed and developed by ACARA also, so really they're cousins. The ACS is designed and developed by, by ACARA, okay, so they've both got the same daddy. Scoodle is focused on the F to 10 years. Science by doing is focused on the seven to 10 years. There is complete overlap in approach. The 5E's model underpins all of these resources. So it doesn't matter whether you're early childhood, drawing on the foundations and backward chaining that into the early years. Whether you're a primary teacher teaching up to year nine, you can be asked, or whether you're looking at this from a secondary model, you will also get resources up to including the compulsory schooling years of year 10. So there they are, they all follow the one approach. So as a language and as a literacy, you know, it's a common one. Taken together, primary connections and science by doing provide a comprehensive F10 science curriculum resource. And don't be frightened of science by doing because it's seven to 10. I mean, many of the activities leading up to and including year eight can actually be simplified and adapted for primary school use, okay? So think closely about that. Don't balk at, at, at primary connections because it's considered to be a, a senior year's program. ABC Splash. Now, I don't know whether um, I've actually put this on, on the, the week three as a video. It's the very last thing you get to see before you leave the week three uh, module. Um, but ABC Splash, um, it, again, is a brilliant resource um, and is going to help provide you with um, a, whole, a whole range of online resources because often science isn't accessible. Often there are safety issues, particularly when we look at chemistry and combustion with, with burning substances. You now, there are safety issues for kids. Um, so what we do is we can turn to simulations, we can turn to videos and information res uh, research resources. ABC Splash is just brilliant. So um, it, I've actually made a small video to navigate through it. If you've used Splash before, fantastic. You know, you don't need to watch that video. It's online for you in week three on the very last page of the, um, uh, the learning bit, as I've called it. Moving through this quite quickly because we're now starting to get to some of the things we really want to talk about. Chemical sciences by year level, if we look at the Australian curriculum, we can see that, you know, in the foundations year, it, it's embedded there. 
objects are made of materials that have observable properties. So we can teach chemistry at every year of the curriculum. Okay, we can do that. And, you know, we don't need to <coughs> subscribe to really heavy and, and hard core concepts of chemistry in order to teach it. As a matter of fact, tonight we're going to look at misconceptions and we're going to look at you know, certain stages in a learner's life when you know, they're only able to actually observe um, the, the very surface level functions of, of, of interactions and, and, and science reactions and, and investigations. But they're not actually able to look at the nanoscopic or, or the microscopic or even the symbolic aspects of chemical sciences. And by symbolic, I mean, we all know the periodic table generally is, is, is not very, you know, very adapted to primary schools. Some two schools do it. There are units of study we'll talk about. But generally, um, you know, science understandings that the primary is are quite simple. And they're usually dealing with surface level structures, what is observable and what can be seen. Year one, we can see everyday materials can be changed physically in a variety of ways. So we can, conceptually, we can see that years one, two and two and foundation are all quite similar. Different materials can be combined for a particular purpose. So you know, this is the whole notion of you know, the early years, years F1 and 2, foundation through to year 2. They're not age-specific. Okay? They actually depend very much on, on, on learner ability and, and on learner navigation. So you know, just because this is year 1, everyday materials can be cha physically changed, there's no reason why you can't address it in foundations, and there's no reason why you can't revisit objects in year 2. None whatsoever. And we can see, you know, some of the, the skills and content involved here, sorting and grouping, thinking about how materials used in buildings and shelters are suited to local environments. And this can be a cultural unit. We can have a look at Indigenous culture and go back and what they did with design, what they did, you know, for heat, what they did for, for a whole range of things in their buildings. Investigation, different climbs, clothing for different activities. And again, you know, this takes you down the field of fashion and design. So there's a lot of interaction here comparing traditional materials from around the world, okay? We can look at, you know, how they're sourced, where they come from, their connection to environment, and so on and so on. So we can see there are so many connections here in these science understandings. I won't go through them all because that will take us our full hour. Um, but basically what I will do is I'll put this PowerPoint slide up online for you to come back to and view at, at your own leisure. I'll put the slideshow online as a set of PowerPoints and I'll also make the screencast available for you after this, this um, online Zoom session. Um, Fire just away. letting you know, um, so I just did PRAC last term and we had a year one class and we actually did this everyday materials can be physically changed. So they had to describe um, how aluminium foil, wool or paper could be used to hold water and show how that they could be manipulated to actually become a container to hold water. And then I think for their assessment, they actually had to create a boat with the chosen material and then see if it would float in a tub and be able to hold, I think it was two dice or something, and then explain to the teacher how they'd manipulated the material to turn it into a boat and get the big enough to keep the pieces in there to make it float all up. Fantastic. And there's so much that can come off that, isn't there? Mm. They had a good time too. <laughs> it was an interesting to see how they would start with a, a big piece of um, aluminium foil, about A3 size, and some of them finished up with something the size of an eggshell because they were just trying to manipulate it and to create it in a way that it would be stable. And yet other people just clipped up the ends and made it look like a little baking tray and it was doing its job. And then them going, hey, how come mine's so little and yours is so big and yet they're both doing what we need to do to show the assessment piece. That sounds fantastic. Well done. Well done. Really, really good. And interesting live learning, isn't it? Really engaged, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I remember doing a, I was visiting a student in Cairns um, several years ago now um, and um, she was running a cooking session using uh, little chocolate buttons. And um, some of the boys in year two had decided it was a lot of fun if you put a chocolate button down the, the back of your pants into your bum crack and, and let it melt. And, of course, uh, the girls thought it was quite gross when the boys started dipping the finger in there and eating the chocolate. So um, 
you know, a lot of different things you can do there. I mean, in there, you know, the teacher sort of panicked and you know, had one of those, oh, yuck moments, you know, my lesson's destroyed, it's fallen apart. You can actually use those moments really, really well. Um, and sometimes when you're teaching, for instance, some of the biological sciences or, or any science for that matter, the more yuck you can make it, basically the sulfur gases and things, and the more noise you get from the group, the more engagement you can likely get as well. So don't be frightened of a little bit of noise, but do be very conscious of safety. Um, that's the only thing I'll say. And lots of great examples. We can go through, you know, chemical sciences, a change of state between solid and a liquid at year three. Natural and processed materials have different physical properties at year four. Solids, liquids and gases. Look, we do the loop. We come back there again. And this whole notion of, um, you know, observation, setting up observation tasks, um, you know, as, as water condenses on the outside of a, a What's happening there? Um, you know, we can look at balloons, bubbles. We can look at uh, ice balloons. A whole range of things that we can hear. We can introduce the concept of mass as a way of measuring um, uh, physical change. Um, so even though form changes, you know, the, the actual weight and mass of the substance doesn't change. Changes to materials can be reversible or irreversible. And this is at the year six. And of course, now we're starting to get a little bit more scientific. And, you know, this gets a little bit more exciting. Describing what happens when materials are mixed. Investigating solubility, investigating changes say caused by heating and cooling. Some really good things coming up here. You see, you're opening up the scope here for a lot more investigative stuff. Uh, metal plus uh, water, having a look at what happens with rust, burning, um, combustion, cooking, um, a whole range of things that you can, you know, trans, uh, transforming um, a whole range of strategies. Now, we're going to talk shortly about chemical sciences as, as a misconception, as, as a, um, a repository for misconceptions. What happens to learners' understandings in, with chemical sciences? And chances are a lot of them actually related to teachers' misunderstandings. But, you know, let's go back. Let's talk again about science inquiry. If we don't know a lot about chemistry, we can actually apply our inquiry skills and become really, really dynamic co-learners in this cycle sequence. Um, oh, meant to go forward, went backwards. And of course, we can go up to year seven and eight. And by the time we get to year nine, we're starting to see a rich repertoire of, of chemical science units. We get into mixtures, solutions, pure substances. You know, and it's a really interesting notion. Um, in week six, I, I raised the question, you know, should teachers actually teach about pure substances? Should we, we teach, you know, the particle view of matter? Um, now, I believe we should, because I do believe if, if taught well and then allowed for pedagogy to work, that kids actually get it. You know, the most primary skid, school kids can tell you that CO2 is carbon, carbon dioxide. So, you know, they, they can tell you that and they understand why. So it is quite teachable. But, you know, we're going to talk today about pedagogy and, and how, how to look at the teachability of it. Properties, okay, can be explained in motion and arrangement of particles, um, which is an interesting field. Differences between elements and compounds and mixtures. Chemical change. And of course, um, I've actually put the year nine ones up here. So not many of you will be interested in those. So I don't think many of you are doing uh, misconceptions at that level. But the message here is that chemistry is not something that you are going to be able to avoid as a teacher. Um, so it's a little bit like going to the dentist for a lot of people. Um, you can see the purpose in it. You can see that it's connected to long-term survival and well-being for everybody, you included. Um, but you can also learn to love it because when you roll up to the dentist and he says no fillings and your teeth are shiny white, fantastic, and all your gums are healthy pink, you know, you're, ha you're starting to really enjoy it. And the same can be done with, with chemical sciences. You can actually learn to really enjoy it because um, the investigative process can be a lot of fun. And tonight we're going to talk about drama. Um, role play, um, storytelling, some of the things that we know how to do really well, even though we may not know, for instance, how to ignite a substance at a low temperature. So lots of things we can do here uh, as teachers because we're teachers. Chemical sciences and sustainability, it, it is probably the dominant cross-curriculum um, priority that comes up. And when we look at it, for instance, we can look at examples of how the chemistry is linked to sustainability. And we can look, for instance, at raw materials in buildings and shelters suited, suited to a local environment. Um, paper, how it can be changed, remade and recycled. So all of these are principles that we can look at, you know, even at the year two level. Exploring changes from a solid to a liquid and liquid to solid can help us to recycle materials. And of course, we know this about sewage as, as, as you know, an obvious thing. Um, and, and we can explore these sorts of things. Poo is a great thing for kids, particularly around year three, because you can, you know, you can get both sides of it. You can have the fun side as well as the, the yuck side, as, as well as the investigation side. Considering how the properties and materials affect, and compost too, I ought to throw in here too, is another one. 
um, and compost teas, little things that you can do with working gardens. And we'll talk about field studies and, and, and applied situations a little bit later. Um, the limitation with this is the time. There is so much you can do with chemical sciences. Um, year four, considering the properties of, of materials affect the management of waste or can lead to pollution. And of course, the ABC have that fabulous series, don't they? The War on Waste. Um, kids love it. You know, it's creating a chorus. At year four, kids are quite capable of dealing with those principles of, of waste management, material management. And finally, up at year nine, products of combustion reactions affect the environment. And of course they do. And, and of course, we can um, look at some of these um, applications as we go through. Um, and I've also presented, uh, asked you this term to think about uh, getting the, the, the phone app, um, Chemical Maze. Now, in Chemical Maze, I'll talk more about it in week six and seven. Um, that should give you a couple of structured tasks on how to use it. But it's fabulous for just getting kids to bring in a list of ingredients, bringing in um, food wrappers that they've had, going through sorting the lists, and then doing the chemical analysis of it using this simple phone app. We can do that with food. We can do it with cosmetics. We can do it with cleaning products. We can look at the toxicity of those products and how they break down in the human body. And therefore, whether something with a heart or a food rating of 3.5 is really good for our health and well-being. Or the cosmetics that your mother puts on her lips are actually petrochemicals and they're eroding the lips and the layers of skin and the epidermis on, on her face. Um, sure, it regenerates, but at the same time, we have to look at what the long-term effects of these things do. These are the sorts of things we look at in week six and seven on how you can use everyday touchable science, everyday touchable science to become a really good chemical sciences teacher. Misconceptions and materials. And this is something I wanted to talk about tonight because um, assessment task two, uh, number one, two, geez, I'm getting ahead of myself. Assessment task number one, um, really looks at misconceptions. And, and so talking this week about science, let's talk about materials. What happens? Now, there's a lot of literature written, believe it or not, um, and I know it's hard to believe, but educational researchers actually um, do a, a bucket load of research into how students actually configure science and learn science. And the reason being there's a great anxiety around science at the moment because science numbers, participation in science is decreasing dramatically. This, you know, and, and we're seeing the same with mathematics. Um, primary school doesn't have an engineering. It doesn't really have a design. It's got creative arts, and creative arts used to serve that purpose. But, you know, this whole notion of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, we're seeing all of these disciplines in retreat. We're seeing less students in high schools completing these types of subjects, and we have a skill shortage at university level. So we've got some major issues here and there's a bit of anxiety around it because let's face it, you know, if we're not smart enough, we're going to you know, go to the Super Bowl of Smarts and we're going to lose every time in the world economy because you know, STEM is very much related to well-being. So the ACS has taken this on board and, and they look at the material world and, and they, they, the model or the representation they have here is that materials are thought of as comprising substances which are in fact chemicals. So... There we've got our principal assumption of where this curriculum's coming from. These, these chemicals or these substances and knowledge of them, these materials, can be perceived on three levels, the macroscopic, the microscopic, and the symbolic. And the researchers doing this kind of work are Gable and Bunce. Now, as you can see, it goes back quite some time, over 20 years. So we've known a lot about science learning. We're still investigating how to make it better. And a lot of this research went into the redesign of the Australian curriculum. So when we talk about the macroscopic level, macro being big or large, it's the observable level. It's the what of physical and chemical phenomena. And they do have a what. Students can focus on these materials. Materials have shape. Materials have form. Materials have pl pliability. Um, and where appropriate, a limit of, of, of a limited range of substances. And note, I see it qualify this where appropriate because it's all right you know, for a teacher to work with a student who can make those connections, but when a student can't make those connections, they become inappropriate. Not every child is born and not every child values uh, a particip uh, par par particulate um, view of, of the world, a chemical view of the world. It's, it's actually alien to most kids. Um, so when we do raise substances, yes, by all means, we can have a lot of fun with materials, but 
the, when we raise this, you know, that, that must be qualified by this whole notion of being appropriate. So we can look at the properties of materials largely at primary school and how these properties change. And we know that energy is a factor in that heat, cooling, um, li liquids, dissolution, evaporation, condensation, all of these wonderful things that we can do to, to materials to change their shape, form and substance, and not so much their substance, but their shape and form, and sometimes their substance. We can burn wood and change its substance. The microscopic level. And here we can talk about the particulate nature of, of, of materials, and that is looking at the world as particles. They comprise particles and they move and have space between them. Now, this happens for some primary students, and there is some disagreement here in the research. Some researchers and teachers argue that primary students can start to appreciate this model, and it does explain, and they understand, therefore, how to explain the behaviour of matter and hence of materials. I would agree with that position. I think kids are highly able to reach that, that position, but I don't think every science teacher is able to teach it. So what we've got here is we've got the macroscopic, which is really the domain of, of primary school and, and particularly early childhood, because it's, it's the what, it's the observable aspects of chemical and physical sciences and materials. The microscopic, we can start to look at the particle nature of it and we can start to see how particles interact, how they move, how they combine, how they separate, and therefore what happens to materials and matter. The symbolic level, okay, it looks at how substances or chemicals can be represented by symbols. Now, while you know, we can look at the chemical relationships here, we've got the periodic table, we've got, you know, yes, secondary level is, is very much part of the secondary curriculum. Um, the primary level, generally not. Now, as I said earlier, some kids are quite able to tell you that CO2 is in fact carbon dioxide, um, but some primary units exist to look at, at, at you know, atomic relations and, and, and um, particle matter, but generally it's not a really strong part of primary education. So when we look at the misconceptions, a lot of you will be looking here at the macroscopic level in your assessment task number one. That is what students are observing. So your diagnostic test is going to be looking at what's observed, the what of physical and chemical phenomena. And this is good because this is a science that you too can work with. You don't need to be an elaborated teacher of chemistry to actually work very effectively in the observed area of, of materials and chemical and physical phenomena. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The symbolic level, I agree, you would, you know, it's gonna be very easy to fall out of your depth there. The microscopic level, um, again, relevance is the key here for primary school kids, keeping it relevant, keeping it appropriate. But the macroscopic, they can see it. They do have it and they do have their own interpretations and representations of it. Your job is to line those up with science understandings. Now, for instance, when we look at classifying misconceptions, um, looking at, at in chemical sciences, um, the, the research done by Anderson, Nell, Watson, and, and three different papers actually came up with, with um, the, the similar sorts of findings, that when we look at what sort of misconceptions kids have, they come in basically five kinds. So when you're doing your diagnostic test and you get student number one says, well, that's just how it happens, Okay, students are unquestioning. You would categorise that as a student who's unquestioning this concept. Okay, so science really is a literal fact. It's, it's, it's there, it's just like that, it is. It's an isness. And kids aren't actually seeing science as a questionable process. So you can see there's some work for you as a teacher to do there. And you may be able to design some immediate pedagogical responses around a kid who says, look, that's just the way it is. That's just what happens. Another common one is displacement. For instance, when we look at, and this, this is related to misconceptions around combustion, burning things, um, that's just how you know, wood, wood burns, it turns into ashes, that's just what happens. So it's an unquestioning view. Displacement, you know, a learner may say, oh, matter's displaced, there's a new substance and it's come from somewhere else. You know, so the smoke has come from the wood. So it's an entirely new substance. Okay, so it's a displacement theory. Modification is the third category that Anderson comes up with. The new substance is considered to be the original substance in a new form, so it's been modified somehow. Okay, interesting notion. Wood turns to ash. It's been modified. Transmutation, another term Anderson uses. The original substance is considered to be transformed into a completely new substance, one not derived from the original reactants, but from some other source. For instance, the flame. The flame may create the smoke. 
and transmutation. Chemical interaction, the scientific view. And here's where we look, you know, and, and this, is, this is the model that we want to steer the understandings towards. Here we've got four classic un understandings or misconceptions of how kids can get science knowledge wrong. They can be unquestioning. They can be looking at you know, a displacement theory, a modification theory, or a transmutation theory. We can then down look down here and see you know, the chemical view, you know, the chemical interaction view, the one we want to move them towards. And, and this is when substances are seen as being composed of atoms of different elements. And depending on what that element is, okay, it's going to involve a dissociation and recombination of atoms you know, along the line that they're forming new substances, that they're having interactions, that there is exchange and there will be reactions as a result of the dif different um, atoms. So we can see here when we look at misconceptions, you will get a range of responses when you ask kids about science. Now, I'm not saying you have to put them into these categories. You know, it's pretty easy to know an unquestioning response. Displacement is pretty hard to tell, okay, but we know a student says, you know, a new substance, the smoke is coming from the wood, okay. That's one thing you can do to explain combustion. But they can explain these things, but it doesn't explain combustion, and, and that's the difference. That's why they're misconceptions. Modification, okay, the new substance is considered to be the original substance in a new form, so it's still the same thing, it's just changed. Okay, water to ice. Transmutation, the original substance is considered to be transformed into something completely new and not derived from the originals but from other source. So, you know, it's like a mixing of three things and becoming one. And chemical reaction, the scientific, the ones we want to move them towards. Analyse you know, the, the language of the feedback you get. You don't need to say this is displacement. You don't need to say this is modification. You don't need to say this is transmutation. Um, the researchers have done that. You're welcome to do it if you choose. But the reality is you, you have to point out in your analysis of that, that, that data where the interpretation is breaking down. Okay? Um, this student is saying you know, this is an original substance okay in a new form um and, and this reflects an unscientific understanding of this concept we're not judging we're just using the word unscientific as the buddhists say there is no judgment okay no blame what we need to do is work with their heads and get their heads realigned get their concepts realigned so here's an example student oh, one sorry Sorry, Colin. Yep. Um, when I was doing my questioning of the children, I asked them questions and I was getting responses like, um, oh, but that's what the teacher told me and that's how it is and that's that. And I'm like, oh, okay, rightio. Yeah. And, yeah, things like that. Yeah, so. Yes, look, thanks for sharing that. And, and that so happens because chemical science, as I pointed out to you, is that one domain in science where teachers try not to explain too much. And they, they go back to representations. They go back to diagrams. If we look at the water cycle, for instance, um, teachers rarely you know, get students to work through the water cycle and role play it and actually experience what water might be happening, you know, what's happening to water and how it may feel and how it may function and what that means. Instead, they'll actually resort to a diagram and get kids to copy it into their books. And then they'll give them a rote test on it. So, you know, but, but, and, and that's why we're getting those really honest responses from kids. You know, that's what the book says. That's what the teacher says. You know, I got, a, I got 10 out of 10 on that assignment, so that's how it is. Um, you know, it becomes its own justification. So um, they still can't explain it, and that's the key. So a little example here, you know, a similar sort of one. The water bubbles aren't really – we're looking at condensation here. The water bubbles aren't really bubbles because they have air in them. Okay, interesting misconception. Oh, because they'd have air in them. And, and – the teacher then says, okay, well, well, what do you think's in them? And the student says, just water. And how do you find out? And here we've got a really simple investigation. He pops some of the droplets. Now, the droplets are sitting on the outside of a cup. And so the, the, this lesson then went on from the individual teacher interactions with students um, where the teacher actually got them together and share their understandings of why you know, and how condensation happens. And they came up with a couple of you know, solutions here. The, the outside of the cup was wet because people bumped the desk and spilled the water. Water came through air holes in the cold cup and mixed with air to form bubbles on the cup. Cups are porous. Water seeped through the cup. The water is so cold that it freezes the cup and makes the water come from inside to outside. We can see some really interesting pseudoscientific 
thinking here? So a lot of these answers are on different scales, aren't they? We're seeing different levels of misconception. And this was a question that came through the, the, the email today and also the, the forums through the week. Um, do I identify a misconception and then deal with it? And you can't squash a misconception like you can squash a huntsman or a spider, okay? The aim is not to squash a misconception. The aim is to open it up. Number five, water could have spilled onto the outside cup when we poured it in, a very logical explanation. Six, little drops, like on cobwebs on cold mornings, could have come onto the cup. Ah, that's a really interesting it, it cross, cross framework, isn't it? We're starting to see some more, more interaction and elaboration there. So um, we're starting to see that you know, the student, student thinking outside the narrow count confines of literal interpretation. And the final one, it could have been dew on the cup because it was cold. The dew could have come out of the air. All right, so now we, the, the teacher then decided, okay, what do I do with this? I've got seven different understandings. She split the class and said, all right, I want you to form groups. Vote for the one that you think is right. Get into your groups and we're going to design an investigation. So they, they each group designed a fair test to explore their, their principle. They completed an investigation. And then together the class went through and looked at the results and eliminated what they thought were dud variables. And the only two explanations that stood up to any kind of interrogation were six and seven. And in the end, one little student confesses and says, well, I know it's number seven because my dad's a science teacher and he told me. Right answer, still can't explain it. So this teacher has still got a lot of work to do. Okay, get into the scientific explanation and she actually brought the father in to do that. And he ran the class for a double lesson, looked at literacy capture, lit literacy capture tasks where she started to develop the language for understanding. And after that, of course, then went into the elaborate and, and um, evaluate stage where they built a pipeline to other examples of, of condensation and condensation in, in situation and, and uh, in, in principle how it works. So a little example there of going from, you know, the very, very direct questioning of students through to you know, collating their understanding, a little bit of data logging, then doing an analysis of the understandings, committing that to a testing process to arrive at a real level of understanding. So here we've got the diagnostic, here we've got the lesson sequence, part A, part B, bumping together. In the end, what happens? The teacher goes through and completes a five E's approach to deal with this one question. Okay, and in looking at that approach, they were able to deal with not one misconception, but seven. Okay, seven and elaborate, develop the one that they decided was actually the closest one to the answer. So that is a little bit of an example of what assessment task number one needs to do. People say to me, oh, do, do I just do one lesson? Well, actually, that's, that's the equivalent you know, in, in the discussion board, this question came up. Do I do just one lesson or do I do just one misconception? Well, brain science tells us, no, you can't do that because knowledge is built from experience. Experience is built from interaction with environment. Environment spits off stimuli. Stimuli creates neural, neural strands and sheaths. These myelin sheaths combine together to form structures. Those structures are neurons. Those neurons actually stimulate recall, memory, and function. So when our neurons are aligned up a certain way, you can't simply change one thing and expect it to correct everything. What we need to do is work with pedagogy. We need to actually get in there and start teaching. Work with the pedagogy. Come up with a lesson sequence that's going to deal not just with one misconception, but it's going to address them all. It's going to do it collaboratively. It's going to refine it. And once it's refined it, it's going to point them towards scientific understanding. That is an entirely new journey. Then we start to look at the, the you know, the remaining three E's in, in, in the 5E sequence, we start to look at how the teacher manages that process. I'll just go back. Any questions or comments about that? I know that's dumping a lot on you, um, but I think at week three of the course, with this assignment due in, in week five, um, at the end of week five, so we're about almost halfway there, it's really time that we started to nail down our understanding of, of what this assignment is supposed to do. Now. Really, your, your data um, need include not much more than what's here. An example of the interaction, the questions. Here is the diagnostic. Here is the collation of the diagnostic, the understanding shared. You may throw a table in there and show every independent, or you may put graphs in 
um, showing what, what each, each respondent you know, said for each, each particular question. Um, and then what you've come up with is your understandings. Your understandings then are a list of the misconceptions. These are your warrant. These understandings are your warrant to move into a learning sequence. You can't, as a teacher, simply say, ah, the moon, that creates a misconception. That's what I'm going to teach. Because how do you know you're not teaching what they already understand? What are you going to do to advance students who already get this? You know, you're promoting disengagement. How are you differentiating between your students if you're going to run with the misconception rather than the learning? Okay? Here's where pedagogy kicks in. It does the differentiation. That is your tool. When we look at the general capabilities, I won't say too much about those. Um, they're mapped across the curriculum, but they, they do come in here again because, you know, we're, we're assuming that not only are we are developing science understandings, but we're doing it in a way that's bringing along, you know, every other student cap capability and capacity with, alongside it. So, um, you know, it's important that we realise that. Um, and they're across the entire Australian curriculum um, and science fits in to, you know, to this network of, of, of knowledge frameworks. I guess that's all it is. Um, something I'd like to promote at this stage, and I know you're very busy, <coughs> and I know it's not always possible, um, but focusing on science investigations. Now, Loxley offers some really good ones. Um, some of these I'd like to point out to you. you know, try, if you can, um, once a week to do a science investigation. There's a little bit of an art to it. You know, I love the ones with rockets and soda bottles and you know, I really love those because, you know, I love things to go bang and whoosh and blow up. Um, chocolate buddies are a lot of fun too. I love melting and cake baking and great way to demonstrate, you know, changes. Um, but some of these really fit in really well. If you can find a way to discipline yourself to experiment with a few investigations throughout the course, even if you only managed to do three for the entire term, that's three more than you would have done. You could look at emulsion at years two, five and six some great, great simple ones to do there. Um, even do them with your own, own children or do them with, with friends or <coughs> friends' children. Um, ice cream, years two and three, great stuff. Crystals are fabulous. Um, elephant's toothpaste is brilliant. Separation, year seven. pH testing at year nine. Okay, so it's, it's the different ones that we can look at because um, many of you are teaching science as an out-of-area teacher and that doesn't mean you come from Mars or somewhere else. It means that <coughs> it's not your comfort zone. You may find yourself as a primary teacher um, teaching science in a secondary school up to year nine. Um, so, you know, the, the message there is learn how to, how to pull on the science um, mindset and don't try to fake it. You know, try and do a few investigations as you go through because once you're in front of kids, you're then managing a class, you're then managing behaviour, then you're managing 27 different learning speeds. You're <coughs> differentiating concepts between different learners. Um, and then you're also supposed to be competent at your scientific in investigation. So rehearse if you can. Don't try to fake it or wing it. A couple of things from the forums this week. Um, <coughs> Must excuse me, I went to Brisbane and I've come back with the, what they call an echo flu, I think. Um, can I use an existing PC unit in my learning sequence? Can I throw that over to the group to discuss, please? What do you think? Can you use an existing PC unit and how? PC meaning primary connections. Reference. Yes, definitely. Referencing is an important part of it. Um, the other thing is that it's, um, it goes back to what I was saying before about simply teaching a, a misconception. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, the primary connections units try to predict misconceptions, but that misconception may not be present amongst your learners. So you run the risk of disengaging them or of missing the real misconceptions if you simply pull the primary connections unit off the shelf and implement it. One of my biggest criticisms of C2C um, is, is that it's just taken off the shelf and used by teachers as, as gospel. When in fact, you know, it needs proper diagnosis. It needs proper investigation. And in this assignment, um, 
the elements you use of a unit will be in, in, expressly connected and explicitly connected to your diagnostic sequence. It's going to be there. So if you're throwing out a general unit, which is like a, you know, a Gatlin gun of science pointed towards you know, physical reactions or chemical changes, that's not, that's not hitting the learning misconception. So the risk of using a PC unit um, is there. They're good, but make sure you use the components, you embrace the components of that PC unit that actually relate to your, your misconception. If you're doing that and referencing, no problems whatsoever. Um, in the response to that on the forum, I actually talk about a thing called simple originality. You're not meant to come up with new content at this stage of your careers, but you're meant to critically implement known and existing content and to simply pull a PC unit off a shelf and say, here's my learning sequence because it does this. You know, my immediate question and the, mar the marker's immediate question too, how does it do that? How does it address your, your misconception? Colin, um, this is something maybe off topic, but I actually am doing prac and I just thought I'll share it. Um, my teacher actually looked at the C2C and she rather actually chose um, the science unit that we had to choose from in the other science and she said it was actually much better so i just wanted to share it's probably totally off topic you know that that reflects a teacher's judgment based on experience maxine that's right on topic um because teachers will you know, hopefully um be quite discerning in their use of some c2c units because yeah, yeah. was going to use it seat she was going to, she did look at the seat and she just said it wasn't really very good because it, they didn't do anything with their hands so then she chose the connection, science brilliant. connection. love that that's brilliant um cassandra talks about having trouble with a sample group um to do the actual and this is a question that does come up from time to time um some students don't have access to students uh, and and to a sample group and i really appreciate the good suggestions that came from a couple of students there in terms of using facebook another person talked about using um the online survey instrument um you know, both good suggestions because the survey doesn't ha have to be done face to face. You're just collecting data. It's then what you do with that data and applying it to your learning sequence that, that demonstrates your teacher connections. Um, Paul is talking about assessment task number one and firing off questions. Can I just raise a point here? Your discussion board is going to be much more helpful to you if you use the subject line if you put something that relates to your question in the subject line. We all know that assessment task number one is real, and it's not a criticism of Paula because she brings up great questions, um, and I really appreciate her participation. But if you can put in the subject line what your question is about, then other students are actually going to be able to come back and look at that subject line saying, wow, that's exactly what I need to know. Instead of, and this is for your sakes, instead of being busy people in busy lives who now have to search through several um, uh, forum and, and posts to find the one that relates to the question they need to know. So the more you handle that subject line, um, the better. Paul has asked quite a few good questions about uh, assessment task number one. And so I, I do um, encourage you to look at those. I've put up some information about testing for misconceptions. Um, this is me trying to um, poke the bear. Um, I really want you to start thinking about misconceptions, about, you know, is, is my diagnostic test, is it working? Is it, is it revealing? Am I able to list seven misconceptions like that little simple example I just gave? Um, and then um, what will I do in my learning sequence with those? I won't pull down a PC unit because I'll look at the PC unit and then I'll adapt the relevant bits of that or I'll look at the bit of the C2C unit and I'll adapt the relevant bit. But I'm not just going to do it out of habit and reaction. I'm going to show the thinking on my feet. Okay, and that's exactly what we want you to do. Show the thinking behind this task. And um, a couple of things here, you know, and a couple of things I planned. How can poetry be used? Um, and think about culture here. How can you use drama or role play? Um, you can. What about art, comics, posters, movies, books, field visits and learning projects, worm farms, chicken coops, little micro-environment examples, compost. A compost experiment can last for ages. It can then be the foundation for a vegetable garden. It can lead into so many different understandings and, and, and you know, and science connections. Oh. Um, I do urge you to go and look at that testing for misconceptions um, forum. 
just a forum post I put up. Um, I would really like to see some, dis you know, since it's discussion generated around that, um, because the, um, you know, the concept behind testing for misconceptions is really important. And it's obviously, if, if your diagnostic test is producing enough information, then you are actually going to have um, a, a really good assignment. It's going to do itself. Okay. And another question is, is, is uh, that I've had two coming through individual emails, and I think I posted that purely because I thought other people should know. Um, when you're writing your response, um, you know, do I simply do one lesson? Is, is that what my lesson sequence is? Well, you know, and, and then another question says, do, do I differentiate between, you know, I've got an older learner and a younger learner. Do I simply say, well, this is targeting the older learner? Um, well, can you do that in your classroom? You know, you really can't. Um, so when you've identified misconceptions, your learning sequence now has to embrace either the five E's, the three P's, uh, POE, whatever it is you want to do, the four C's, whatever inquiry process you use, you have to embrace that level of differentiation in your classroom. Little Johnny may be miles away from his science understanding. Okay, Lisa uh, may be spot on. She may get it already. My question to you in this assignment is what do you do with that as a teacher? Do you simply say to Lisa, look, I'm going to teach you Little Johnny stuff. You know, I know it's going to bore you to death, but you, know, you already know it, so I'm going to go for the low-hanging fruit. You don't. Whatever you do must be pedagogically based. It's not about the mis misconception. It's not about teaching content. It's about pedagogy. The first E, engage. The second E, okay, explore, explain, okay. Going through fourth, fifth Ds, evaluate and elaborate in the right sequences. Use your pedagogy, link it to your misconception. Now, Clearly, you don't have to do a full unit in a 5E format, but you're demonstrating aspects of each of those 5Es that would relate to your misconception. You're relating aspects of your predict, observe, explain, your POE, that relates to that misconception. Think about it. Okay, don't simply produce a one-lesson response. This person got this wrong, so therefore I'm going to teach it to 26 other kids as well. That's not what this assignment's about. It's actually about embedding knowledge creating a pedagogy and allowing that pedagogy to spill out across a range of signed activities that embraces literacy, that embraces understanding, and embraces collaborative and individual tasks as well. So have a little bit of a look at that one for some further ideas. <coughs> Any other questions? Doesn't matter. Jackie, okay. um, I, I just wanted to ask, so for the diagnostic testing of the children, could we start off with an experiment and show them an experiment and ask them to explain what happened? Is, Ab could absolutely, you yes. That? Yep. You don't, and just say, what do you think happened? Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Colin. Yeah. And then all you do is log their responses and then you collate it and represent it as a series of misconceptions. Um, areas where, where they, they did agree on knowledge and where the knowledge was connected to science understandings and areas where, where they weren't and what the disagreement among the group was. That gives you your territory. That's, that's your teaching real estate. So you're not going to grab a unit off the shelf and say, I'm going to teach all of this now. You'd actually grab a unit off the shelf and say, which parts of this unit articulate to the, the knowledge framework in my class? That's a really good question. Any other questions? One for me, Colin. Fire away, Loria. Uh, uh, I, I understand in the um, assessment task, it's saying that we can choose from biology, earth and space, chemical or phys uh, physical sciences. Yes. Um, although this unit is more specific with chemical um, sciences in that, um, mine is based on, mine is based on uh, earth and space, so I guess that's acceptable because it's in the... the assessment task uh, instructions. Absolutely, Loretta. And, and my reason for that is it'd be totally unfair to assess you on chemical and physical sciences at this stage of the course because we haven't done it. Okay, so yeah. for that reason, we open up the science process and, and encourage you very much to explore it with the tool you're comfortable, with the science field you're comfortable. And yeah. next assessment item, we move into spaces where you'd be a little bit less comfortable. 
thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. That's definitely a good question and one well worth um, confirming. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or, or concepts people would like to raise? Um, the discussion forum, as it says up the top there, not active enough. It's very quiet, guys. Okay, I've never known it to be this quiet in the course. Makes me nervous. Um, get busy, no matter how silly you think a question is. Some people are emailing them in. It's better if you can put them on the forum. I know it involves a little bit more you know, social context, queuing and risk. But if you can do it, because um, you, you know, rest assured, I have this theory that whatever you're thinking, five or six other people are thinking it too. Okay? This whole unit makes me nervous. Now, who are we getting there? <laughs> it's good. It's good to be a little bit nervous. Um, but, you know, this, it, it's got to do with how we see um, physical and chemical sciences. We see it as a hard discipline. We see it as, you know, needing to be wired in a certain way. Where in fact, that's not true. Um, Play-Doh, you can build, you know, atomic models using Play-Doh. We can explore materials using Play-Doh. We can do all sorts of investigations. Chemical maze, you can explore anything in your house and cupboard and laundry. You know, and we can do all of this analysis and build all of these understandings. Um, and we can also use role play uh, and role play and, and, and seeing now um, in that discussion, testing for misconceptions, I've put up an example, a brilliant example of, of where a teacher actually gets the students to role play what happens to molecules or materials under certain conditions. So when it you know, becomes, a, they had to role play a solid, then they had to role play a flexible solid. And then they, they had to, you know, when dye is added to a water, they had to role play what actually happens there. And the teacher simulated this with a piece of blue paper. And the response of the kids was amazing. Now, first of all, they, they all, all gathered around the bits of blue paper, that the girl with the blue paper, who was the molecule, the active molecule, she was the dye. They all gathered around her. Then they all ripped a piece of the blue paper off and separated away from her. And this was their interpretation of dissolution, of, of, of you know, the colouring process of water and how it actually happens. And, of course, that makes for a brilliant exploration then on, on, on the part of the teacher. And she also finished that unit off, not just with the role play, um, but then she finished it with a classification exercise too, where she gave them a whole range of substances and asked them to classify into solids, liquids and gases. And every single student in the class did it accurately and correctly. So we can use drama, we can use role play. All of these soft things that we think aren't worth a lot in, in the science field, I'm telling you now they will be the saviour of the science field and saviour of science as a discipline because they are the tools by which kids can relate. And that's all we need to do is get them to relate to this field. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Does anyone like to conclude with a comment or observation? All right. On that note, then, I think it's time for me to hit the record button and, uh, and get this posted for you. Um, Kelly Lee, you've just come on. Is there a question you want to ask or everything all right? Um, no, Colin, I'm, I'm okay. I, I'm just having, um, I've had a couple of experiences with um, the students that I've been working with to find some misconceptions, but getting from misconception point um, and then building that, that understand that shared understanding and listing that um, I'm coming up with a couple of misconceptions with only one or two shared understandings. And it's not enough for me to then go on to um, with my, sort of diagnostic tool and then sequence. So I'm trying to ask more questions. So I'm sort of at this point of haven't got anything solid at, at the moment. Right, right. Don't forget your diagnostic process is, is actually just to elicit the, mis the misconceptions. Okay. Yeah, if you can come up with, you know, as we go back to this little example here, um, and if you can come up with the seven understandings that they shared that explain a science principle. Now, only two of them, pseudoscientific and yeah. one of them number seven is quite close to the science but they're all distant so they're all really misconceptions so if your conversations if you can come up with some shared understandings that's the launching point where you then start to consider how am i going to teach this unit okay. because i think i think i'm overthinking that a little bit too much to get as more information yeah <clears throat> definitely and, and this is why i described as thinking on your feet because sometimes yeah. this, yeah. This can all happen in one lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Often you. Teachers do. Things up. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. If there are no other comments, I, I will um, hit the escape button and, and um, record this and get it posted for those who can't make it tonight. 
Um, thank you all for your attendance and for the great questions that come through. I'm not getting a lot of questions, but the ones I'm getting certainly are good. Um, I will keep trying to predict what you might need to know, but I'd really prefer it to come from you. I'd really love you to drive this um, so that I can be more assistance and you know, feel a little bit less anxious about what you may or may not be thinking. So on that note, please keep them coming in. No question is too silly. Um, and I do, you know, look forward to answering as many as I can. Right. Could I have a question, please? Ah, who is this? Cass. Cass. Okay, Cass, far away. My question. What time is the class? The class is at five o'clock. Right. For some reason, I've got it as six. Thank you. All right, Cass, that was an easy one. Yeah. I don't know why. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm glad you could make it at least. I'll, I'll get this recorded for you and get it posted so you can see the rest of it. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. And thank you once again.